As we have friends that are joining us, I'd like to thank you for being a part of our first Lunch and Learn of the year. My name is Maureen Stapleton, and I am the Executive Director of Celebrate One. Before we get started, I have a few announcements. Please be sure your microphones are muted and your cameras are turned off during the discussion. We will be recording this session and sharing it on our social media channels. Also, we will be taking your questions, so please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we will answer as many of those as possible. Today, we are talking about the dangers of marijuana use during pregnancy. There is mounting evidence that marijuana may harm pregnant women and their babies. The Center for Disease Control and other major medical organizations, such as the American College of Obstetri uh, Obstetricians, excuse me, and gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend against marijuana use during pregnancy and while breastfeeding, whether that's through smoking, vaping, or applying creams or lotions to the skin. What are the risks of marijuana during pregnancy? Joining me today are three panelists who will point out the harmful effects of marijuana use during pregnancy and the long-term impacts on a child after birth. Let me introduce you to our three panelists now. Our first panelist is Dr. Mark Klebanoff. Dr. Klebanoff has been researching the effects of illicit drugs during pregnancy at the Abigail Wexner Research Institute at Na Nationwide Children's Hospital since 2010. He is a professor emeritus of pediatrics at The Ohio State University. He also has served appointments at OSU, including the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the College of Medicine and in the Division of Epidemiology at the College of Public Health. Dr. Klebanoff is a general pediatrician and epidemiologist who received his MD and MPH degrees from the Johns Hopkins University and completed his pediatric residency at the University of Rochester. Also joining us today is Olivia Baum. She has been working in the, at the Family and Children's First Council since 2019. She currently serves as a resilience coach, collaborating with local agencies to share her expertise in child development and trauma. She attended Erickson Institute in Chicago where she earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and master's degree in early childhood education and child development. Our third panelist is E.C. Green. E.C. is the president of Physicians Care Connection, an affiliate of the Columbus Medical Association. She has been with the organization since 2009. Her primary responsibility is leading the effort to coordinate healthcare services and resources for Central Ohio's most vulnerable residents. Ethi believes she is serving her God-given purpose by helping people. Her favorite saying is, leadership is an opportunity to serve. She is a graduate of the Ohio State University, earning her Bachelor's of Arts degree in Chemistry and Master's degree in Public Health. Now, before I turn over, um, for those of you who have most recently joined, we'd ask that you turn off your cameras and mute your computers during the presentations. And I'd like to turn this over now to our first presenter, Dr. Klebanoff. Thank you, Dr. Klebanoff, for being here. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for, um, for having me here. And um, I'm going to do my best to cover this. It's really a, a a condensation of two talks that each would run about 45 minutes and so I'll try to uh, I'll be moving quickly and 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 in just skimming the surface but ready to I'm happy to answer questions so if we could have the the slides I guess I don't control these here so um somebody could advance the slide um the title of the talk is marijuana use during pregnancy short and long-term pediatric impact right next slide um, 
I have no conflict of interest or, or financial relationships to disclose other than I've done research on marijuana use and pregnancy that was funded from the NIH, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, as well as um, the March of Dimes. My next slide. Um, to basically uh, cut to the, the, the chase, this is a preterm birth. Um, that is um, delivery before uh, 37 weeks. And can you see my mouse when I, um, well, anyway, I don't know if you can, um, but these, um, this is one that was recently done. This was just from last year. These are many, or really all of the studies that have evaluated um, marijuana use and its short-term outcomes. By that, I mean, its effect on early delivery on low birth weight um, and on, on an undergrown baby. And what they show is if you look at this, um, if you look at uh, uh, really both graphs, you could see that dark vertical line would be marijuana has uh, no association. Anything to the right of the vertical line means that there's, there's some evidence of harm of marijuana and anything to the left of it is, is means there's uh, some evidence that exposed children actually are less likely to have the outcome. And the bars represent the study, uh, the uncertainty of each study. And when you get to the bottom, these diamonds show what happens. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. Somebody has an unmuted mic. They were locked in. Um, anyway, um, the, uh, the, the diamonds show what happens when you combine all these studies. And what you could see, especially if you go to the bottom, is there is a, a modest increase risk of preterm birth among women who use marijuana compared to women who don't. And, um, but if you look at these individual dots in their bars, you see that the results are kind of just numerically all over the place. Um, and there's another combination of studies that I didn't have time to put up that showed that the studies that were able to control for whether the mother smoked tobacco or not showed a less harm of marijuana than those that didn't, which I'll return to later. It shows that there's some uh, confounding there by, by other exposures. So let's summarize everything on the next slide. And this is from the same article. Um, LBW is low birth weight. PTB is preterm delivery, that is early delivery, and SGA is, is a baby that is small when you, even when you consider how long the pregnancy lasted. And what the, the, the column entitled group effect is the relative increase in these outcomes among women who, who use um, marijuana. And the numbers in parentheses are just the, a measure of the statistical uncertainty. And what you'll notice is um, that there is what by epidemiologic standards would, would be considered sort of a, a modest to moderate increase in risk of, of, um, of the outcome among women who smoke uh, marijuana or who use marijuana. Uh, for example, if you look at the 1.39 for preterm birth, it would mean that if a woman who didn't use marijuana during pregnancy had a 10% chance of, of delivering a preterm baby, then a woman who did smoke marijuana but was sort of otherwise the same would have about a 14% chance of um, having a, a, a premature baby. In contrast, and we don't have it here, is um, that a woman who smokes tobacco has a, a about a double risk of some of these outcomes. So. Uh, that's sort of a, a, a benchmark. And you'll also notice in the far right column that for all of these, the people who wrote this overall summary thought that the quality of the evidence was just not very good. And if you look at the footnote, you could see that the, the word high heterogeneity basically means if you looked at the individual studies, their results are just all over the place. They're, they're not at all consistent. And then there are bias, biases that I'll come to in the next couple slides due to um, measurement error and, and what we would call residual confounding. So let's look at the next slide. And what I mean by confounding is that on average, women who use marijuana do a lot of other things um, that 
are without a doubt not good for the pregnancy, not good for the woman, and not good for, for the child. Uh, women who um, use marijuana are more likely than other women to smoke cigarettes. They're more likely to use alcohol as well. They're more likely to use other illicit drugs. They tend to be on prescribed um, psychotropic medication, things like, like Prozac and other things, more commonly than other women. And they themselves are more likely to have uh, some mental health issues. In, in particular, they report higher levels of anxiety, depression, and stress, none of which um, are particularly beneficial to the mother or the, the child. And they tend to have differences in, in social class. And most of the research has been done in sort of specialized populations, like women in, in drug rehab settings and things. They, and some of it, therefore, might not apply to women in, in more typical um, healthcare settings during pregnancy. Um, even besides these things, studying marijuana use is not easy. I'll talk about some of the problems on this slide. Um, most of the studies relied on women to report their own exposure. And in many settings, if a woman reported that exposure that she used marijuana, it would pretty much initiate a child protective service referral so that women might have a strong incentive to uh, deny use. And even if the prenatal caregivers were using uh, toxicology tests, there's an extensive literature to show that, that those tests are not observed, obtained at random. Perhaps if the woman shows up at the hospital in premature labor, they might be more likely to get a urine sample for toxicology. Um, if the woman appears, I put suspicious or disheveled or appears intoxicated at a visit, that might prompt a, um, 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 a, a, a toxicology test. There was a famous paper during the 90s in the, in the cocaine epidemic where um, in a county in Florida, a researchers anonymized urine samples from pregnant women and um, measured cocaine in them. And they found that African American and white women were about equally likely to have cocaine metabolites in their urine. But when they looked at who got identified clinically and who got reported, African American women were much more likely to get identified and reported. So there's certainly bias in who gets labeled as a user. Most of the studies that looked at this didn't do a very good job of, of getting a sense of when during pregnancy the woman used. Did she stop using during pregnancy? Did she start? Nor how much, uh, how often she smoked or how deeply she inhaled. And many of the older studies were done when marijuana wasn't as potent as it is today. So there are a lot of complications in trying to study this. Let's look at the next slide. Um, so that the results of short-term things like prematurity and low birth weight are um, kind of mixed. There are fairly few studies that have looked at how these children do long-term. And only two were specifically focused on marijuana. And both of these studies uh, started 40 years ago or more. One was done in Ottawa, that it, which is uh, in Canada. And it, it studied mainly middle-class uh, pregnant white women. Um, and the other was done just a few hours down the road um, in Pittsburgh. And that was more um, of a lower social economic status higher risk of women at uh, the, the university hospital. And um, a little over half of the women in, in the Pittsburgh study were, were African American. And these were the only two cohorts that were specifically focused on, on marijuana. And they were done by uh, psychologists and psychiatric epidemiologists who were very interested in how these children did long term. So let's look at the next slide. Um, uh, to, I, I'm going to skip over the, the, the early outcomes on birth weight and things because they've been covered elsewhere by other studies. Um, uh, back up again, please. Um, in the Canadian study, Bailey score is, if, for those who may not know, is sort of a general IQ score uh, that's used in children under three years of age. In Ottawa, 
they found marijuana exposed children didn't develop any quicker or slower than unexposed kids at two years. In Pittsburgh, they showed some lower scores at nine months, but when they tested these children again at 19 months, um, they found no difference in general IQ between um, exposed and unexposed children. But things got interesting as they followed these children along. So let's look at the next slide. They brought these children back at preschool age years um, and then again at, at kindergarten and first grade age years. And they started seeing some very specific defects that were remarkably similar between these two uh, different populations. They showed that marijuana exposed children had deficits in short term memory, in visual skills and visual reasoning and in abstract thinking. And amazingly, you, you can test these higher level functions in children that young. But what was fascinating is their general IQ was not different from the children uh, whose mothers didn't use marijuana. In other words, this is a very, very specific defect that actually is of some importance. Uh, they brought these children back in at five and six, and they found that the results were repeating themselves from what they had seen in three and four. So let's look at the next slide. And they continued to follow these children uh, when they were 10 to 12 or so, when they were, that is, kind of tweens and, 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 and pre-adolescents. Again, their general IQs were not different from the children who were not exposed to marijuana. But the deficits that they saw in very specific skills um, persisted, and that is their ability to think abstractly, abil ability to make sense out of what they're seeing, ability to focus their attention. And these things led to um, problems that their parents and teachers reported with these children being inattentive at school, being impulsive, being unable to kind of respond control themselves very well. And um, the parents and teachers reported that these children had what would be externalizing behavior, that is things like acting out, delinquency. Um, and what the psychologists who did these studies realized that these are important parts of a very higher thought process in humans called executive function. So let's look at the next slide about what is executive function. It is not, it, it's really more properly called executive functions because it's kind of a collection of processes. And I think of it as, as not just how well your IQ tests, but it's the ability to do something useful with the intelligence um, you have. Interestingly, when people have studied it, it correlates at least as well as your IQ does with your success in school and with your success in life because it involves your ability to focus your attention on the problem at hand, the ability to resist impulses and things that really help you advance in life. This is a function that begins to develop rapidly during preschool years, and actually most of us continue to develop our executive function through about our mid-20s. So let's look at the next slide. Um, the, I call it thinking fast versus thinking slow. Um, executive function is what you have to do to succeed in things that take kind of some mental effort and that aren't routine. So facts, things, there are components of EF. One is working memory, and that would be the ability to keep information in mind while you've got something else to do and then retrieve that information and, and use it. The best story I give is when I go to work, I drive down I-71 every day and get off at Main Street. When my daughter was younger, she took Saturday morning classes at the Columbus uh, College of Art and Design. And you had to get off at Broad Street, which is the exit before. Well, half of the time when I drove her there, I forgot to get off at Broad Street because I was so running on autopilot to get off at Main Street that I just drove right by the exit. And that's a failure of my executive function and my working memory to remember, hey, I gotta get off this highway at Broad Street. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to shift what you're thinking about to apply different rules in different settings. 
Um, it would be like if I'm driving home and I hear on the radio that there's a traffic jam up ahead of me, is my brain able to start thinking, all right, should I get off here and take a different route home or should I just slug it out in the traffic jam? And then inhibitory control. And the best example of inhibitory control I could think of is Simon Says. Because think about that game. You have to resist the impulse to do what you see. You have to resolve conflicting information when the leader says, put your, you've got your hands on your hips and your lead, the leader says, put your hands on your shoulders. The leader puts their hands on their head and they never said Simon says. And so you've got three pieces of re conflicting information that you have to resolve while resisting the temptation to do the first thing that pops in your head. That's executive function. And then the ability of like planning your day. Like if you've got a bunch of errands to run and you, um, um, you want to think in your head, it's, it's Saturday morning, how do I drive to all these places to do it efficiently and map that out in your head? And these are some of the things that EF does. Let's look at the next slide. Um, and so in summary, this is not an easy thing to study because of the things I discussed, but there is some evidence that marijuana may be associated with a modestly increased risk of preterm birth and low birth weight, but studies are consistent. And marijuana probably is associated with long-term deficits in higher intellectual functions, although not with a de deficit in, in IQ. And I, I think personally the, the, the latter one hangs together real well because that correlates with where the cannabinoid receptors are in your brain. They're in the same areas that control uh, executive function. And um, unfortunately, the obstetrician sees a pretty normal baby and thinks they're done. But I think the real concern with marijuana shows up when these children go to school. And that would be um, my summary um, of, of a lot of literature. And I think uh, the last slide is just, uh, um, um, I'm mostly working from home. So the phone number, um, you can leave a message and I'll call back, but uh, I, my email address is still good. So I hope I didn't run too far over, but um, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Klebanoff, uh, for such compelling information that you've just shared. Um, we will come back and ask you a few questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our second presenter is Olivia Bob from Franklin County's Family and Children's First Council. Olivia? Yes, thank you, Director, for the introduction and uh, Dr. Um, Klebanoff for the amazing setup. Um, so if we could advance to the first slide. Um, today, I really want to talk about stress, reward, and resilience, um, and really answering the question of why might mothers be engaging in marijuana use? Um, I think it's a important to understand the background and where they're coming from. Um, so if we want to advance to the next slide, um, I will try to go through some of this as quickly as possible. Um, there is more to this uh, kind of visual, uh, but we'll kind of stay within this bound. So we utilize the work of Dr. Bruce Perry and other researchers, but we're going to utilize his work today. Uh, he talks about there are five states um, within our stress response, right? So it's kind of a continuum. So what you're seeing is five different states that we can be in at any given time, and it's really impacted by the stress uh, or the perceived Threat that we encounter each day. So the best way to explain this is through an example. Um, the other day I was super calm. I was actually working on this PowerPoint presentation and a lot of it was like modifying some of the slides. So it was really methodical, um, very calming and relaxing. So I was in this calm state, right? There was limited stress. I was just kind of preparing this. I was sitting on my couch drinking coffee. Um, so during that calm state, I was able to actually access my executive functioning, right? When I'm calm, I can think a little bit clearly, I can plan for the future. Um, so I was preparing for this presentation to come up. We're having a little bit of challenges with my nephew um, in his school. So my sister calls me as I'm doing this work and she's like, uh, the principal wants to meet today. Well, the school's an hour away. I'm like, all right, cool, I can do that. Let's do it for two hours. I have enough time to get ready. When she had called me, I jumped from that calm state to an alert state. 
I was aware of the things that were going on. However, in that alert state, we can still access our executive functioning. We may not be planning for years to come, but we can plan, you know, in that moment in the future uh, and kind of access that. So I became a little bit more alert, aware of my surroundings. Um, so I get ready. I start to leave. I get in my car. I drive about 500 feet and my car stops working. It starts shaking. It locks up. I am no longer alert. I am like alarmed. I'm about to enter that fear state. I'm like, what's happening? I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. <laughs> so uh, I get out. I try to jump my car. I do all of these things to uh, get it to work. When I'm in that alarm state, I'm thinking here and now. What am I going to do in this moment? Um, so I, some lovely human came over and tried to save the day and three people ended up helping push my car out of uh, this intersection that I was about to enter. Um, and I was able to kind of calm down and get a little bit more alert. But in that alarm state, I wasn't able to access my executive function functioning very well, right? I was like, where am I going to go? How do I get to this meeting in time? When those people helped me in that moment, I fluctuated from alarm back down to an alert state, and I was able to contact family um, and friends to uh, get things done. I was able to get a car. Um, I left my car where it was, and I was able to get to the meeting on time. The fear and terror states that we can be in, that is when we um, hit like a perceived threat or uh, a state of stress that is so pervasive that um, we end up shutting down. Like uh, there is nothing that we can do in that moment. We really just, uh, it becomes almost like this uh, reactive state where we just are reacting to anything or we completely shut out and dissociate. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the five states that we can be in. Again, they fluctuate throughout. A big thing that I want to note with the arrow is people who have experienced trauma or who are in states of high stress can stay in that alarm state. Uh, typically, if we're not experiencing those things, 80% of our day is in that alert, right? Aware of things. But when we're experiencing that stress, that trauma, we are more alarmed and we keep most of our day in that state. So when we perceive a new threat, Instead of jumping from alert to alarm, we're jumping from alarm to fear. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now that we are aware of some of those states, I want to talk about reward, right? Our brain, when we talk about reward, our brain is not, um, this is not an idea of like, I get my work done so I get a sweet treat, right? It's not something that we earn, but our brain is seeking out reward all throughout the day. We have a certain level of reward or our bucket that we want filled, and we um, are doing many things throughout our day to fill that bucket. So when we're calm, uh, we are, think of this as being like in the shower uh, and all these thoughts flood to you, or right before you go to bed, you're laying there and you're in this like calm state. You're really relaxed. Typically you spend this by yourself. Um, that meditation, uh, prayer, this is when we, find reward and things that align with our core beliefs or our values, right? But volunteering, um, doing these things that uh, we can really think in the future that hit those core beliefs. Um, when we're alert, we're looking for those relationships. We find reward in the relationships and physical intimacy uh, that is around us. When we're alarmed, uh, this, is my, this is something that I think about when I get off Zoom meetings a lot too, is that sweet, salty, fatty, crunchy foods. When we're alarmed, um, our body is craving high intensity. So this could be high intensity workouts. When I got in the car to drive an hour away after my car shut down, I was scanning the radio, just trying to find really loud, high, fast beat music that would help calm my nervous system in that moment because I still was riding on that alarm state. When we are in fear, there is nothing that can be rewarding aside from like a removal of distress. So when we think of this, people might dissociate or people might escape, 
right? We are just trying to get away from whatever perceived threat is causing us distress. Um, going back to that executive functioning, a lot of times in this moment, it is shut down. We're not able again to access our prefrontal cortex, right? And our thinking or learning brain, we are really just reacting. And the last one is terror. And again, you don't often see this in people um, in this state, but this is when nothing is uh, rewarding and there is a complete shutdown, again, dissociation. Um, people might kind of pass out and uh, there's only, the only thing that will really help in this moment is a removal of the threat and time to come back to it. Um, next slide, please. So this, this slide and something that I wanna really think about is when people are utilizing marijuana, they are um, utilizing something that is helping them cope with stressful situations, right? When pr pregnancy is a novel experience, right? And we experience, when we experience novelty, we perceive it as threat. It's new, our body is responding to it as a stressful thing. Um, and so we're coping with it. This could be a mother's, you know, second or third pregnancy, but this one is still new, it's still novel. Um, and in this state, uh, we are again seeking those rewards. Marijuana use is a reward, right? It is something that helps us calm our body to regulate. All of those rewarding things, we are accessing them to bring us back down into a calm state. When we want to take away something like marijuana use that is a coping mechanism, we have to find something that is able to fill the gap, right? We are removing something that is extremely rewarding and pleasurable for someone and is helping them deal with stressful situations. So what are we replacing it with? That's where the resilience factors come in. These resilience factors, there are many resilience factors that we have in our lives, right? But we really talk about these five main ones. A big one that stuck out for me in my moment of stress was connections to community. These lovely humans came over and they helped push my car out of the way. <clears throat> they helped bring me down out of a calm state. That brought reward. Another rewarding aspect for me when that in that moment was being able to rely on other people in that moment of calling a friend for a car. And I had to take another friend's dog out. I was like, I have no time. I had another friend that I could call and say, I need help. Can you please take this dog out? When I think of resilience factors for um, pregnant women and mothers is centering pregnancy or those peer groups that they have access to. Um, these can be really beneficial in providing some of that reward, that support that they need to potentially quit using a substance use or learning new skills. So when people go into community or to centering pregnancy or these peer support groups, peer support groups, they have other people who are going through the same thing as them. In that, they get to share their experience, right? How rewarding is it to share information, feel validated in the stressors or the things that you're going through. When they have a win, when they do something um, such as I think of, you know, getting stable housing or accessing um, child care or um, getting a new job, those can be moments of success. Those are resilience factors, right? A lot of times I think of as practitioners, we're the cheerleaders. Um, we get to celebrate those big wins, those moments of success. That's a resilience factor. In those communities, they also are learning new skills, right? A lot of times I've been able to observe centering pregnancy and they're going through what child development looks like, right? What does breastfeeding look like? They're learning these skills and gaining this knowledge and information that allows them to persevere. They get to move forward. So even if they take a couple steps back, um, when I think of marijuana use, if they're trying to stop, and they take a step back and they utilize it in one moment, they still have new skills that they might be able to access and move forward um, and try new additional skills. When they have moments of success, they persevere. They also have a sense of hope, right? If we have a sense of hope, that allows us to keep moving forward. I know that tomorrow could be a better day. And the last one is self-regulation. And this really comes into play with that reward that we think of 
what is rewarding to us and what is helping bring us back down to that calm state. How do we do this for ourselves? What are tools that we have that allow us to self-regulate? This is something that um, is a huge resilience factor because even in the state of alarm, even in high stress situations, if I have the ability to self-regulate, then I have the ability to activate my other resilience factors and keep moving forward. We like to think of it as a wheel or gears that lock together because once we activate one of them, we start to activate the others. If I have connections to community, I have moments of success, I get to persevere. And then there's a sense of hope. Um, and then in the middle, we have curiosity, right? So how are we getting curious? This isn't necessarily a resilience factor that are talk that's talked about often, but it's something that our team really finds beneficial um, in these conversations about resilience because we can get curious about what a mother has as resilience factors, right? Maybe she has a strong sense of community already. How do we continue to build that up so that she can, she can lear learn new skills through these communities? If she doesn't necessarily have um, a sense of hope, what can we do to provide her with the feeling of a sense of hope, right? How can we get curious about the tools, the resources, um, the things that she's already linked with that continue to build, that can, we can continue to build up these resilience factors. Again, these, they come into play. This is fine, you can leave the slide. Um, these come into play when we are thinking about what we're taking away. Again, how are we building or bridging the gap between removing something and adding additional? The last slide um, is again, reward in the brain and how we activate our brain's reward system. So the things that we come into contact with um, that can be rewarding gives us a sens sensation of pleasure and it releases these hormones um, that calm our stress response, right? They bring us back to this calm sensation. So on the left, some of them can be um, things that were activated early on. So um, music and rhythm. When we were infants, did our caregivers kind of rock us? And we developed this rhythm, this sensation uh, that brings reward to us when we hear the music that matches our rhythm. That positive human interaction, physical intimacy, those release dopamine, oxytocin, that calms our nervous system. But when we may not have access to these, we might engage in things that might be more maladaptive because again, we still have a reward bucket that needs to be filled. So what are we doing when we are noticing that they're utilizing these um, other re sensations of reward, such as alcohol use, right? Marijuana use that helps fill that reward and it helps cope or it helps them cope with stressors, right? It's bringing them back down to their calm. So how are we replacing it? The last thing I want to leave us with is being aware and cognizant of the brain's reward system, right? And what we're utilizing to self-regulate and cope while also being um, aware of resilience factors. Uh, it leaves us with, again, being curious. As practitioners with this information, how are we being aware and asking um, questions of what needs does mar marijuana meet? Right within this mother, what need is needing to be met and how is marijuana use fulfilling it? And what else can we match it with? We can also look at the situations that they might be in of what environments are birthing persons and uh, women living in that might be causing them stress and to utilize substance use. And the last one is what might they be coping with, right? What environment could they be in and what are they coping with? These questions, wonderings are an opportunity for us to um, get curious and to have some of those hard conversations. We're building up resilience factors. We want them to be as successful as they can be, but we need to bridge that gap. And that is all. Uh, I saw some questions in the chat, but I know we'll get to those. But again, this is my information. If you have additional questions, 
uh, feel free to email. Um, I'd love to set up time to talk. Thank you, Olivia, very much for that presentation. E.C. Ikabara Green will be our final presenter today, and then we will move to your question. E.C. All right. Good morning or afternoon now. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I'm with Physicians Care Connection. Um, we're affiliated with the Columbus Medical Association. Um, this slide just demonstrates uh, uh, our operations for our organization. Um, we are aligned with the social determinants of health. And so some of you have seen um, this diagram before. It's from the Healthy People 2030. Um, this is the best way to really give a 10,000 foot uh, level description of our organization. And we're not the only organization in this community that is functioning in this way. Um, people are experiencing different barriers. And so what we do is we try to work with individuals to help them um, in each of these uh, buckets. Um, the work that we do uh, is uh, direct services that we can provide from our, uh, our own organization, or we partner um, with other people in the community so we don't duplicate services to meet the needs of individuals that we serve. Next slide, please. So these are the three areas or the three service lines that we um, are focused in. We have our patient-centered medical home services. We have a free clinic that um, runs um, every Monday evening out of the Columbus Public Health Department. Um, we also have doctors um, and other uh, healthcare providers who are volunteering in their office to see um, people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access care. We have our healthy pregnancy, pregnancy services, um, and that is where our step one for a healthy pregnancy program um, operates out of. And then we have our social determinants of health um, services, and that is where we have care coordinators that are providing high touch um, care coordination and services for individuals who, who need need um, their, their handheld, empowered, uplifted, um, and also to help navigate um, our uh, system of resources in this community. Next slide, please. So this is a little data about our dashboard. Um, and what's important here is um, to see the, the variety of uh, services that we've provided, um, the number of barriers um, that we're trying to meet um, for individuals. Um, and when you look at this, it's important because uh, what we've noticed, particularly after the uh, uh, the pandemic, well, not after because it's still occurring, um, that the needs that families um, and individuals at risk have have uh, definitely increased. And so our job is to try to figure out, um, to treat that family as a whole. What is it that we can do to help them um, meet their needs, meet the needs of their family, so ultimately they all be able to impact their health? Next slide, please. So step one for a healthy pregnancy came out of, um, I know you guys know most of this history about the Greater um, Infant Mortality Task Force. And so um, based on the things that we were experiencing in the community at that time around infant mortality rates, particularly for African-American women, um, there were eight recommendations. There's been another strategic plan. And so those um, recommendations have actually been updated. But for step one, um, our goal was to really help women enter into prenatal care um, as soon as possible. Uh, we want their first trimester. Uh, the literature and the data shows that early access to care um, improves those health outcomes. And some of the things that we wanted to address as we were helping women um, access uh, though that care was barriers, right? Insurance. Um, all systems or all providers don't accept the same insurance. And so how can we make it easier for moms who are pregnant to know where those services lie? Um, if we need to help them um, access Medicaid, um, then we will help with that process. Um, that's gonna be really important now. I know we've had a little law. Um, there hasn't been Medicaid rede redetermination due the, during the public health emergency, but uh, we all know that um, coming up here in April, um, that those redeterminations will hit. Um, and it is important for us to make sure that if they are eligible for an insurance product, that we're, we're taking care of that so they can access that care. If they don't have insurance, then what we've done is we've aligned ourselves with the hospital systems and we understand um, where they still can seek care, um, even if they don't have uh, insurance. And then we're looking at other um, high risk uh, barriers or things that they need to access um, during the pregnancy. So for some women, um, we can uh, take them on and we do case management for them. We can refer them to um, NFP or the Healthy Families uh, Program. Um, we can connect people to substance use services. Um, we also make sure that as we're referring um, individuals to a prenatal provider, we're assessing them as an individual and what they need. Uh, different pre prenatal providers offer different things. Um, some have social workers on, on site. Some have um, 
medication assistance uh, treatment programs on site. Some don't, some, some won't uh, see patients who are dealing with the substance use. Some take insurance, some don't. We wanna take that monotony out of uh, trying to figure out where they can, where people can find their resources. So we've aligned ourselves with the delivery uh, hospitals and also the other private care providers um, to help women uh, find out where they can receive prenatal uh, appointments. A lot of folks think that they need to schedule those appointments at the delivery hospitals, mass clinics, but they're private practice providers that uh, take Medicaid or other insurance. We also help people apply for marketplace. If they have private insurance, we'll assist them as well. So again, we wanna take the difficulty um, out of trying to figure out where is it that they need to have prenatal care. We also are assessing their previous prenatal history um, so um, we can better understand if they need to see a high-risk provider or another provider to address their, their situation. Next slide, please. So this is a data from um, 2022. It's uh, our preliminary data. We're still running things, but this is the number of appointments that we've been able um, to schedule throughout the various providers. 50% um, of the women they live in the celebrate one zip codes. That's important because those are the zip codes with the highest um, infant mortality rates. So we want to make sure that services are reaching them. And then 38% of the women that we serve are African American. And you can see from the insurance status here, about 69% of the people we're serving um, are on Medicaid. And so the things we're doing uh, when they're calling us is we're ensuring that their Medicaid is still active before we schedule that uh, appointment for the provider. Um, should they need other services for Medicaid, such as um, in, uh, transportation, um, it's important to know that when someone has straight Medicaid, their access to uh, transportation is through a different route um, until they choose a provider. And so we are in the background um, ensuring that they've kind of tied those strings or applied for whatever service they need. Um, the other thing that's important is many times women will call us and they're two or three or four weeks pregnant. A lot of providers won't take them for their first appointment um, for seven to 10 weeks. Um, and we've assessed them. We've assessed that they are having trouble with uh, housing assistance, food. And so what we want to do is try to address some of those social determinants of health while they're waiting for their prenatal appointment. And then we're sending that information on to the provider so that they have a social worker or CHW or somebody that is at their site, they can continue to provide those services. Or uh, we, can con we can work with the um, mom and we can provide those for her as well. So there are a lot of things that we're doing before they actually have the prenatal appointment so that that goes smooth for them. Olivia talked about um, the different states of um, response that people are living in. And a lot of the women that we're working with, they are in that alarm state. And so if we can make even one thing easy by helping them understand how to access their prenatal care uh, quicker and then tie up those things, interpreters, uh, transportation um, services, while they're waiting, we hope that it, um, it alleviates uh, some stressors for them. Next slide, please. So during our assessment, we do ask about women who are using substances. Um, and we know that in this community, there's been large efforts around um, opiates and um, tying people um, to treatment and um, recovery services. And we are very grateful for our partnership with Comp Drug and working with us and the hospital systems also to get people connected. Um, however, the women that we're working with, we've always known that there's been marijuana um, issues, alcohol. Um, and so we have partnered with Comp Drug and other treatment uh, providers to figure out you know, what their services are and how we can refer those women um, into uh, treatment or work with a hospital system that may offer some of those services um, and get them tied that way. So you can see, um, I gave some data before the pandemic, what our substance use looked like. Um, and I will tell you that this number in 2022 is the highest we've ever had uh, for the number of women who are admitting to using substances. And so of the people that are reporting um, using uh, substances, the bottom graph shows you the percent of the women who are using marijuana. Um, they are eating it. Uh, they are smoking it, they are vaping it, um, they are doing it, um, as Olivia alluded to, um, a lot of stressors that are occurring um, in where they live. They, they live on constant alarm of trying to figure out how they're going to um, deal with the day-to-day -day crisis and struggle. I think a lot of them have lived their lives in the alarm state and have just learned to function um, in that state. So 
when Olivia used her uh, beautiful diagram to talk about um, reward and response, getting uh, people through those different phases, it's, it's not a small feat. Sometimes you're dealing with um, a lifetime of behaviors. Uh, there are behaviors that have gone through generations of their families. Um, and so trying to make some of the changes that help to reduce those stressors is something that um, it's not a one size fit all solution. It's day to day. So we have women that if um, they're using, the first thing we want to do is educate them on why the importance of not using any um, drug uh, during their pregnancy. And we uh, typically have an engagement specialist on staff that is helping us uh, to talk to those women. And so the purpose is to get them connected to um, any substance use provider um, as early on in their pregnancy as possible. If they refuse uh, to accept that help, then our care coordinators try to either get them connected to uh, another case management um, organization that may take them on if it's not our case management, or we also try to align them with providers that should that person change their mind and want to seek help during their pregnancy, then they'll be able to do that with that uh, particular provider. We're also assessing some of the other stressors uh, that these women are experiencing um, in their environment. And so for those who would like it, then we try to uh, work through plans with them to help them alleviate those things. It could be that they're like 30% of the women I believe that we uh, have are living with uh, somebody else. So they don't have their own place. Um, some of them are not working. Some of them don't have access to transportation. Some are working, some have chronic illness. And so we're trying to work with those individuals to address those barriers so that we can also connect them to services. And as Olivia said, maybe that will reduce um, them wanting to use marijuana to, to to um, cope with whatever situation that they're dealing with. Next slide, please. So I end where I start to say that um, for these individuals that are using substances and for anyone that needs prenatal care, again, we're trying to provide these wraparound services. I really feel like every woman who is pregnant should have an advocate or a doula or a case manager, someone to walk through the system with them um, to help them address not only their pregnancy, uh, which is important, but the other things that they're facing deadly in their lives. And that's all I have. Thank you, EC, for that information. Uh, and I appreciate it, all three of our presenters today. I have a few questions. Um, and so I'm going to start with Dr. Klebanoff. Dr. Klebanoff, marijuana is a natural ingredient. So why isn't it better than a prescription drug? Um, you know, it's it, <clears throat> funny thing. We had a it just expired, but an NIH grant to study um, the effect of, of marijuana on preschoolers and school age children's um, psychological function. And we did some focus groups as as part of that, uh, including some women, uh, some of those moms who did or didn't smoke marijuana. It was amazing how common that point was raised that marijuana is a natural substance. What's so bad about it? Well, you know, tobacco is a natural substance. It's simply the dried up leaves of a plant that grows in the Americas. People have been making alcohol from grain and from fruit ever since recorded history for at least 5,000 years. So alcohol is a natural product and opium is just extracted from, from um, poppy flowers. And so all of these are natural products, yet I don't hear anybody saying, gee, tobacco is natural. What's the harm in doing that? So um, the whole, it's an interesting question, but I just don't see it that way. And of course, the other point is that you don't necessarily know what you're getting when you use marijuana because you don't know where it came from. You don't know if anybody adulterated it with anything. You don't know any of this stuff for better or worse, at least when you get a legal licensed drug at the pharmacy, you know what's in it. Um, but but even that aside, it's just because something is natural um, uh, and a natural plant doesn't mean that we, we should all go out and, and eat it or smoke it or whatever. Thank you, Dr. Klubinoff. And to that point, uh, we, we had a horrible case last year of some Ohio State University students who uh, chose to um, go out and find marijuana and it was laced with something and they died. And mm -hmm. so uh, to your point, we don't know what you're getting and with prescription drugs, you, you do. Um, Olivia, let me ask you a question. Why does a mother's choice to smoke marijuana matter when it comes to child development from your perspective? 
Yeah. Um, so we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but uh, a big part that we present on is how the brain develops and it develops in a sequential order, right? And during utero, the most rapidly part of the brain that's developing is the brainstem. And the brainstem controls a lot of that stress response. Everything filters through our body from the bottom up. And even high stress can alter the development of the brain and the brain or the brainstem. And that part of the brain is controlling uh, uh, an infant's heartbeat, right? Their breathing, um, their uh, kind of body temperature regulation, a lot of the ways that they regulate their own body. And it serves as the foundation for further development. Um, so Dr. Klebanoff kind of alluded to the uh, ongoing effects of later childhood development, but it all starts with kind of the development of that brainstem and how we're building on it throughout the rest of development. Thank you for that um, answer and drawing in what I was going to do, which is um, uh, some, some really salient points of Dr. Klebinoff's presentation. EC, how does step one assist a mother who, and now you, you talked about this a little bit, but how do you to assist a woman who is, has marijuana dependency? What are the organizations you rely on? What are the things that you do, the steps that you take? So definitely, like I talked about our, our, our relationship with comp drug and what I did with Alex was we tried to identify other treatment providers that we could refer women to uh, from an educational standpoint. You know, one of the things that's a little difficult is that some of the women are using the marijuana for nauseousness. Um, and we've seen where they've said that the provider has uh, prescribed that for them. And so I think for us, it's the education piece. So getting them to a substance use provider and i will tell you most women who are smoking marijuana they don't want the referral to a substance use provider um uh, as dr clevenal said or as we it's it just it's like you know it's normal for them um and so it's it they don't really see it as uh cocaine or you know or an opioid right and so the education is huge it's and it's something that i feel like we can't just accomplish in one phone call so that's why the referral that so let's say you don't want to go to the substance use provider well maybe they'll trust us as a, as a as a case manager and so the case manager as they continue to meet with them will continue to discuss right uh, are you still using you know let's talk a little bit more about that education some of it is trust right um if they don't trust, then they're not even going to listen to you or even self-report. So we we are actually uh, pleased that women are self-reporting more um, about that use. And I think we need to continue to educate ourselves on what we can do to get them to that provider that can continue to help them um, relieve some of that uh, or, or, or not have that use. But my own uh, opinion, which, you know, I'm not a medical person, I think the, the if you can't relieve the stressors, so right, so Olivia talked about the environment. If we can't deal with the environment, I'm not sure, or, or talk to them in that way, right? It's one thing to say that it's going to harm the baby, right? We shouldn't be doing it. But then what is it that we're giving them instead, right? Um, to relieve that need uh, to smoke that marijuana. To me, it has to be a combined effort of, the substance use, and there also has to be some other case management that is occurring hand in hand in order uh, for it to work. And again, that's my unsolicited non-medical opinion. Thank you for that unsolicited non-medical opinion because <laughs> you are seeing um, women every day who are in need of support uh, and, and supportive services to, to make that transition away from marijuana use. So uh, that's why you're on the call and that's why we're so grateful that you were able to pres present today. Um, the majority of the 70 some folks who are on this call are practitioners or human service providers or those people who are connected to the work of the social determinants of health that uh, we all know uh, impact uh, someone's coping skills. But this presentation will be shared on our social media platforms uh, at the city and at Celebrate One. And so others will have an opportunity to see it. What should a woman do if members, or what should anyone do if members of their family are using marijuana in the home, especially if they're move, uh, using it with a pregnant or a parenting under the age of one or two child? 
what what should a woman do or what should a family do to get that member help or what should they say? Give them some um, concrete steps to take. Anybody can answer that. I'll answer for EC. Call step one. Right? Yes, you can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Call step one. Um, are there other resources, EC? You mentioned um, Comp Drug. Mm -hmm. you, uh, there's also some a great deal of information and access to service providers through Adam H. Can you talk a little bit about that? Where should someone go and when could, if they, if they don't call step one, what's the next step? I, I, I would look into Adam H. So I would comp dread to me and I'm not, this is, you know, there's other service providers out there. That's the one we have the closest relationship with, but Adam H also has um, a number of providers that uh, could uh, assist. I believe Columbus Public Health, they have some, uh, services that uh, will allow, again, think of this, if you can't get them to the substance use piece, try to get them to a community case management services. That way they can continue to uh, emphasize or work with the individual through um, their stressors or through their their problems to, to get help. Um, Olivia talked about it, the community connection, they need those connections. So maybe through that connection, Celebrate One has community connectors, right? Maybe through those connections and that trust relationship that they build, they'll be able to then seek the substance use uh, help because you got to think about it. If it if it's a norm and it's in their household, those are some of the cycles that you have to you have to you're battling to break. Excellent. Um, we're going to turn this over to the. Oh, I'm sorry, Olivia, you wanted to answer. Go right ahead. I was just going to offer along with that is like empowering them to know that they have voice and choice, right? When you feel like you have a sense of control over your own situation and you have these resources available for you, that voice and choice and that sense of control can really help lower your stress levels and help regulate you um, and kind of furthering your decision making. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're going to turn this over to the chat and I'm going to ask that Fran Russ, the communication manager, um, look through the chat chat for questions to ask of our panelists. So while Fran is setting up to do that, we do have a couple of really good comments that are that have come into the chat. Uh, one from Audra Jordan, uh, Step uh, Clinic (STEPP) also accepts all pregnant women with substance use disorder, and so that is a resource in the community. And they do OB care on site. So that is also a benefit. So you can go and get both your OB care and uh, substance use disorder uh, assistance and support. Um, Cynthia Ward said, Ohio Health does not do substance abuse, but the social workers can refer for substance abuse treatment and, and they have resources available. So if a mother or family wants help, they can get that help. Um, as we, as Fran begins to look at questions and begin to ask, I would ask that uh, you continue to put your questions in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can in the next like 10, 10 minutes. So Fran, take it away with the first question. Sure, the first question. So we can be in the alarm state on a daily basis, not just as a reaction to an incident or event. Yeah, um, so we can stay in an alarm state as long as the stressors are there, right? If there's a pervasive stre stress and we're not able to escape it, we can stay in that alarm state. Um, I'll use the example of my car, right? My car continues to be a stressor for me. For the past couple of days, I have stayed in an alarm state because um, it is ongoing. Um, and depending on kind of the toxic stress that someone might be living in, um, EC talked a little bit about the environment if uh, the things that you're coping with are still ongoing um, and you're not able to take a step back and re get some relief from that, you can maintain that alarm state. Okay, another question. And there's some tough words in here, so bear with me. Some researchers are looking at cannabis as an effective treatment for hypermesis gravidarum. I hope I said that right. How do we balance the information presented in today's talk with what others may be publishing about this potential 
benefits of cannabis use in pregnancy? That sounds like Dr. Klebanoff questions. <laughs> that sounds like one for me. Um, it's uh, it's commonly believed that um, marijuana is uh, you know it's uh, is is beneficial for women who are having um, nausea or vomiting to the point where they they can't eat or it, it's impacting their blood chemistries and things. But you know, there's not a lot of hard data to say how effective it is or isn't. There's just a lot of kind of anecdotes that people tell and you know to be honest, uh, Zofran is is uh, the common drug that people have given um, um, are given for nausea in, in a lot of circumstances. And there's been a fair amount of research on that um, during um, during pregnancy. And by and large, it it seems to get a reasonably good, clean bill of health. And you know, from our hard experience with with cancer patients and in pregnancy, we know it's effective. So I would say talk to your prenatal caregiver and, and see if they can write you a prescription from a medicine who, at least we know what it does and what it doesn't do, unlike marijuana, where you're basically the test pilot for something. Excellent. Thank you for that, Dr. Klebanoff. Fran, next question. Um, Ashley, there's just more comments. Um, Ohio Health Wellness on Wheels will see someone without insurance we also provide transportation assistance if needed. Um, Step Clinic also accepts all pregnant women with substance use disorder. Um, Ohio Health does not do substance abuse, but, but the social worker can refer them for substance abuse treatment. Good. So there's another question that uh, that has come up in conversation, and that is, and and I think I know the answer because you, you, Dr. Klebanoff and others were pretty clear. But is there any difference uh, between using during pregnancy versus using during breastfeeding? Um, the uh, nobody really knows. If you actually read what the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said, is they said we recommend against it for the simple reason that there is not enough good evidence for us to say it's good, it's bad, it's neutral. And they said, given everything else we know, the, the cautious approach is to avoid it. So it, it, there's surprisingly little known about um, uh, any harmful effects or good effects or any effects of, of marijuana uh, during breastfeeding. And another question that has come up, and we know it comes up all the time when we talk about tobacco use. What about secondhand marijuana smoke? You know, um, not well studied, frankly. Um, it, it's not easy to study because a good number of the people who are exposed are users themselves and you know may not want to admit it. it it's a difficult thing to study and the literature on it is is remarkably thin um, and remarkably thin says that we really don't know exactly and so if you want to be the test pilot for this thing then you know go ahead but you, you got to know that you're you're being the test pilot understood um the Cel Celebrate One has worked with ACOG, and you just mentioned them, Dr. Uh, Klebanoff, to co-brand uh, one of their um, information flyers on marijuana use. And that co-branded material will be available to those who came, who registered for the call today. So we'll send you out that flyer so that you can copy it. Uh, we and our connectors and navigators will uh, continue to use it as well. Um, so that's one aspect of additional resources that as practitioners and human service providers and those who are working in the social determinants health can have a, a particular vetted piece of material that you can hand to parents and those who you are seeing. The other thing that you will receive today at the conclusion of this uh, webinar uh, is a uh, survey on the information that you received today and um, suggestions for future um, future uh, webinars and opportunities to lunch and learn. 
If we can go to the next slide. Today's takeaways. What is the one thing that you would like pregnant and nursing moms to know about marijuana during pregnancy? What is it the one thing that you would like to know, uh, to share with pregnant and nursing moms to know uh, about using marijuana during pregnancy? And I, I'll, I'll leave that to the three, and then I'd ask people to put your information or your answer to that in the chat. Dr. Klebanoff, what would be your one? Um, even, I would say, even if everything turned out all right in your pregnancy and with your newborn, uh, from what we've seen about long-term impact, it doesn't mean you're free and clear. So one powerful thing that uh, we can share with moms who are, and, and, and dads who are experiencing this, very good. Uh, EC, what is the one thing that you would like pregnant and nursing moms to know about using marijuana use during pregnancy? Um, that they're human, we see them, and they should call step one for healthy pregnancy if they want help, 614-721-0009. Repeat that number again. 614-721-0009. Thank you. Olivia, what is the one thing that you would like pregnant and nursing moms to know about using marijuana during pregnancy? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is that habits are really hard to change, right? And validate that experience um, and connections to community um, and resources are the best way to be successful. So really recognizing that engaging in this behavior is adaptive and it's regulating for some reason. So recognizing what need is being met by this um, and what can we replace that with um, to meet that same need. Thank you. This concludes our lunch and learn for today. On behalf of Celebrate One, I would like to extend our deep appreciation to our panelists, Dr. Mark Klebanoff, Olivia Bob, and E.C. Ikebar Green. As I mentioned, we are recording our session today and we'll be posting it on our social media channels and our website soon. So please be sure to pass this information along to your colleagues who may find the information beneficial. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your afternoon.